Have you ever tried to clean up a broken thermometer? Anybody have that experience? We had a thermometer drop in our, kitchen, our uh, bathroom. It's got a tile floor. I didn't know that happened because the glass was all cleaned up. All those little tiny shards of glass, someone had swept them up, and that was great. But I saw a little black spot on the sink, so I rubbed it, and it just smudged and smudged and smudged. Mercury spreads out. And then I got a, a paper towel and sprayed it and wiped it some more, and it came clean. And then I saw a little spot on the floor. And I wiped that, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. This went on for weeks. Yesterday, I still found another spot and wiped it, and it's still smearing and smudging all over the place. Mercury is not supposed to be good for you, so when you wipe it, you shouldn't lick your finger and then wipe it again. I didn't do that, because I realized finally that this wasn't just a spot of dirt. In today's message, we're going to see that a clean heart is much more important to our God than clean hands. We sang about being whiter than snow, and it's talking about our hearts. It's talking about God clean, cleansing us from the inside out, and he promises to do that. So clean hands are a good thing. It keeps you from getting sick. And all of our younger people out here today doesn't mean you don't have to wash your hands when mom and dad say, go wash your hands. You can't say, Pastor Mark said, my heart is more important than my hands. It is, but when it's time to eat, wash your hands, just like mom said. That's important. So we're continuing our series from the Gospel of Mark. It's called The Crown and the Cross. We're seeing Jesus as a man of decisive action. He has a mission, and he's going to accomplish that. Mark is one of the shorter of the Gospels, and it just gets right to the point every time. I love how he does that. And he divides Christ's life into two parts. The first eight and a half chapters are focused on him being the Messiah. It shows his miracles. It shows him as the king who is worthy of wearing a crown. And then halfway through chapter 8, on through the end of the book, Jesus is headed towards Jerusalem. And he begins to reveal his mission to his disciples, to the people following him, and saying, Yes, I'm the Messiah, and yes, I will wear a crown, but right now, I'm headed to the cross. I'm headed there to die. That's my main purpose. And so the readers, us, the readers 2,000 years ago, were seeing this shift from, here's the king who's come to claim his throne, but it's a spiritual throne. So the Gospel of Mark is just such a great way of seeing the life of Christ. Last Sunday, we saw Jesus calming a stormy sea. His disciples were afraid. And not only did he calm their fears, but he helped them overcome their unbelief, their hard hearts. Those who reached out to him in faith were healed. And it showcased his power as king over all creation, including weather, the laws of physics as he walked on water, and his ability to heal any problem with the human body. So we're moving on through Mark. Today we're in chapter 7, and we're going to see a group of religious leaders seeking out Jesus with the purpose of discrediting him. They are coming with closed minds and hard hearts. They can't accept Jesus as Messiah because he hasn't bought in to their version of Judaism. He hasn't elevated and highlighted them and said, what a great job you're doing. So they're out to ruin him. And they attack and accuse his disciples in relation to some of the traditions of the elders. So Jesus will respond by pointing out the problems when people focus more on the outside than they do on their hearts. We're going to see how religious people follow traditions. And because of that wrong motives, they can become hypocrites. Jesus, the Son of God, has the authority to interpret the law and to fulfill God's Old Testament laws. And we're going to see ourselves in this, that no matter how hard we try, we can't make ourselves clean. We can't make ourselves acceptable to a perfect, 
holy and pure God. And most importantly, God's word is going to reveal to us that it's only through Jesus that our hearts can be clean. So that's what's coming. If you have a bulletin, I didn't bring mine up with me, there's an insert sheet there. You can take notes. If you're watching online, Mark mentioned earlier that you can go to faithlife.com slash Dunkirk Baptist, and you'll find a digital version of the bulletin that's especially helpful for you. You can't scan the bulletin because you're sitting at home or wherever you are watching right now, but you can follow along with that digital bulletin. So if you'd like to take a copy of your uh, Bible out, we're going to look at Mark chapter 7. You can follow along on the screen. I'm going to read the entire passage, verses 1 to 23, as I usually do, and then we'll go through section at a time and explain what's happening in God's Word. Please pray with me to prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for bringing each one here this morning through the slippery roads. Thank you for the picture of the white snow, thinking about our hearts being made pure by you. You gave us that picture in Scripture, and every time we see the snow, instead of grumbling, we can think of you and say, thank you, God, for cleaning my heart and making me whiter than snow. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open, that our ears would listen, that our minds would be ready to hear and receive your word today and to respond. How can we change? What do we need to do differently in our lives as a result of what we heard in your word today? Lord, I pray that everything we do and say would glorify and honor your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. So Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or, mo or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about this parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, whatever comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within 
and they defile a person. So we're going to look at four different aspects of this passage. First of all, we see the, power, the Pharisees' accusation in the first five verses. The Pharisees and scribes were the religious leaders of the day, and they must have been hearing more and more about Jesus, hearing about the miracles, hearing about his teaching, because this is the second time in the Gospel of Mark that he records they came down from Jerusalem to check him out, to see what's going on, to see this man from Nazareth who claims to be the Messiah, to see if the miracles are true. And again, as I mentioned, they're doing this with closed minds and hard hearts. They're looking for an opportunity to discredit him. Last time, they claimed that he was casting out demons with the power from the devil himself. And Jesus said, how illogical is that? If I was on the devil's side, why would I be casting out demons? I'm doing this through the power of God. And he warned them about the leaven or the sin of the Pharisees and King Herod. Another time they challenged him because some of his disciples, while walking through a field of grain, gathered some of the grain and ate it. And they said, oh, you're working on the Sabbath? They were just walking through and gathered some food as they walked and ate it. So they were looking for the little tiny aspects of the law, the tradition, and saying, you're not following the law, but it was really about the traditions. And now the accusation is that his disciples, some of them, not all of them, but some of them are eating with defiled or unwashed hands. How many of you were taught to wash your hands before eating? No exceptions, right? You always have to wash your hands. Well, have you ever been camping? Have you ever been out fishing or hunting and eaten without washing your hands? Guilty, right? It's a good thing to do. It's good to get dirt off your hands so you don't transfer it into your body. But particularly, what's happening here is a tradition of the elders. And Jesus made a point of saying that. It's a tradition that you've handed down. And on myjewishlearning.com, I looked up Natalit Yadayim. And that is the tradition of hand washing before you eat. And so we think, oh, that must have been one of God's laws. Traditionally, Jews do a hand washing before they eat, and it is totally ceremonial. They don't use soap, and they have a two-handled cup so that with one hand they can pour three times, and then they can switch hands and pour on the other hand three times, and then as they hold up their hands, they repeat, repeat a blessing and thank God for the food. All of that sounds okay, right? Thanking God for our food is good. Washing our hands is good. But they made this up. The only time that God said to wash your hands was specifically to the priests as they were going into the tabernacle and they were going to offer sacrifices. They were publicly and ceremonially, ceremonially cleansed. That's a tough word to get out on early Sunday morning. They washed from head to toe behind a screen, but it was public, so people could see what they were doing. And that's all that God said. But the Talmud, which is the Jewish writings, the religious law that was added to explain and greatly expound upon the Ten Commandments and God's original commands, is what people kept following. And they added all of these very, very specific little nitpicky rules and laws. And that's where they went so far off track. Notice it's not God's word that's the source of their law, their theology. That's what Christ said. You've rejected the commandments of God in order to establish your own traditions. And that's what this is. It's a tradition. Is it okay to have traditions? Yes. We have traditions in our home at different holidays and different times of the year and different things that we do traditionally, but they're not God's law. 
They're not his direct commands. So if we don't do them, it's just okay. It's okay. Some churches have traditions that become so set and so hard fast that we think, oh, that must be in the Bible somewhere. Well, it's important to recognize what's in the Bible and what's not in the Bible because traditions can be broken. Traditions can be okay, but they're not scriptural. Some extra-biblical texts or writings, like the Talmud, are what caused the Protestant Reformation because the church kept adding laws and rules and all kinds of things that were not in Scripture, that were all man-made, but they were promoted as though this is the way to please God. This is the only way that you can be right with God, is if you follow all of these extra traditions. And we need to be careful, even today, that we're looking at God's Word and saying, is this the source of my authority, or is it something man-made? So there were additional times. We're still on the other slide, John. Sorry. There are some other times. I'm way off my notes if you're following them, so just doing things in different order. There were other times that they had to wash besides before a meal. They had to wash when they woke up in the morning, the same two-handled cup. They had to wash after a meal. They had to wash when they came back from a cemetery. And when they came back from the marketplace where they were out with all of those dirty people, they sometimes took an entire bath cleaning themselves. And again, for the Pharisees, separating themselves from the unwashed masses. In Jesus' day, the Mishnah, which is part of the Talmud, had 35 pages describing how to wash your household vessels and other household items. 35 pages just explaining all of the rules and traditions. If you've ever been in a kosher home, they have two refrigerators. They have two sinks. They have different sets of items to cut and cook and prepare different food items because they're not allowed to touch. They go to great extremes to follow the traditions, but they've lost the heart of what God was saying. Some other fun things really quickly. On the Sabbath, the Talmud said, don't wear false teeth because they might fall out and then if you pick them up, you're doing work on the Sabbath. Don't look in the mirror on the Sabbath because you might find some gray hair and want to pluck it out and you're doing work. If you're plucking, that's work. If you want a handkerchief, you have to wear it. You can't carry it, putting it in your pocket because that's working. Carrying something is work. So if you want to have a handkerchief handy, it's got to be tied around your neck, blow your nose, and then tie it around your neck again. Yuck. If a man had a wooden leg and it caught fire on the Sabbath, there was a big dispute over whether he should carry it out of the house or if he should just leave it there because he shouldn't do work on the Sabbath. All kinds of extremes, again, about a tradition that was man-made and not from God to begin with. The conflict was not only between God's truth and man-made traditions, but it's between two very divergent views of sin and holiness. What makes me sinful? Is it actions and traditions and breaking traditions? And what makes me holy? Is it keeping them that makes me right with God? Or is it God who cleanses me and makes me clean? The rabbis and the Pharisees appear to have added all of these extra man-made rules so that they could become the experts in the law. That's where the term lawyer came from. It was God's law that they were experts in. And if you had a question about the law, you went to one of them and they could explain it to you and probably charged you a hefty fee for it. They also were further distancing themselves from the rest of the people. We know how to follow the law and the traditions, and look at us, look how great we do it. You follow us, be like us. Pride, control, superiority seem to be the motivation rather than pleasing God, which is what the laws were about, first of all, to begin with. And that seems very evident in the way that Jesus responded. 
he comes right out and says, you hypocrites. Now we're up to Jesus' condemnation. Rather than directly answering their question as usual, he turns it back on them with some serious accusations and then provides some examples to clear it up. He used the term hypocrite, and that came from Greek theater, talking about the masks that they wore. How many of you have seen that symbol? I just saw it this weekend as we went to a play. That's the symbol for drama, for theater. And in the old theater, because they were often far from everyone on stage, they wore masks to show their emotions. There's the happy mask and the sad mask. They would have different masks, and the characters would put those on so that no matter how far you were, you could see that face, and you knew exactly what was going on. But behind the mask, you could be sticking your tongue out. You could be smiling with a frowning face. You could be doing anything you want. So that's where the term hypocrite came from. Outwardly, you're showing one thing, but inside, totally different. And Jesus said, You're a pretender. You're imposters. There's no sincerity in what you're doing. And you're dragging all the people down with you. So Jesus quotes Isaiah and talks about a people who would give lip service to God without really honoring him or his commandments. He said, these traditions that you've come up with, you're treating them as though they were God's law. And here's an example. God says, Honor your father and mother. And he also said, if you revile, if you insult your parents, that was punishable by death. So it's pretty important to God to honor your parents, right? Especially as they got older. There were no nursing homes. There were no convalescent homes. You took care of your parents for life. And the Pharisees came up with this really sad trick. They called it Corbin, which meant a gift for God. Is that a bad thing? No. You could say, here's a new car I got, and God, I'm giving it back to you. I want to use this car to glorify and honor you. How many of you think of your home that way? God, let me use my home to welcome people, to show hospitality, to care for people. If I can pick up people with my car... That's great. God, I'm giving this back to you. I want to use it for your glory and honor. No problem with that. But in this version of the tradition and the law, Corbin, they would say, this is a gift for you, mother and father. I've set aside a thousand talents, but you can't have it because I've given it to God. And in their little laws, they said, I can keep that money. I can continue to use it. And if anything happens to you, you can't touch it because that's a gift to God. I did it in your name. It's kind of like when you open up the envelope at Christmas or birthday and it says, a gift has been given in your name to this charity. Have you ever gotten one of those? It's a nice idea. But if you needed something, you're kind of like, oh, yeah, I could have used a little help here. It's a great idea, but I don't get this gift. It's just been given away to someone else. The Pharisees said, this gift is given to God. No one can touch it. But the giver gets to continue to use it for the rest of their lives. And eventually, where does it end up? At the temple. And who gets to use it then? The Pharisees, the scribes, the the priests. So this was quite a... um, What's the word I'm looking for? Scam. Thank you. (laughs) Doesn't that sound like that? But they made this the tradition. They made this the rule. And they could make a big show of, yeah, I'm taking care of you, mom and dad, but I'm going to give it as a gift to God instead of to you. So they looked good, but they didn't really help their parents. The hypocrisy of that was that it was really for their own gain, their own gratification. And in doing so, they totally broke the Ten Commandments. They weren't honoring their parents. They weren't caring for them. And verse 13 says, And so many other such things you do. This is just one example of the many things that you're doing. 
So Jesus defends his disciples by exposing the hypocrisy of their accusers. They weren't breaking God's law by not washing their hands before eating. They were breaking a tradition, a man-made tradition, while the people who were accusing them were obviously clearly breaking God's law. And now Jesus makes an authoritative declaration, verses 14 to 16. Jesus calls everyone around, says, listen up, and he makes an unbelievable statement. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him to make him unclean. It's the things that come out of a person that defile him. Wait, was Jesus actually saying that it's more important what you think and believe on the inside than what you do on the outside? Is that possible? Could he have been saying that your heart is more important than your actions? I thought I was supposed to behave properly. I thought I was supposed to always show good manners, to speak when spoken to, to be respectful to my elders, to not make a fuss. If I do all of these things, won't mommy and daddy be pleased with me? Won't God be pleased with me if I just follow all the rules? Isn't that what good behavior is all about? Pleasing someone? Jesus announced to this crowd that the source of honoring God is holy living from within, not from the outside. What's in your heart is what God is looking at, not just your outward actions. And in 1 Samuel 16, 7, we have a common verse. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. This is when God sends Samuel to the family of Jesse, and he's looking at all of his sons and saying, which one's going to be the king? And he picks out the tallest, most handsome one and said, surely he must be our king. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Our goodness doesn't come from outside. To be good or righteous, our hearts have to be right. The passage that Dawn read with us this morning from Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick. Who can understand it? God looks at the heart. God knows what's going on inside of you. And the Jews had taken God's great laws, and Jesus summarized them as, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, with everything you are, honor God and love your neighbors as yourself. They took that beautiful set of laws that God made, how we relate to him, how we relate to people around us, and they turned them into a religious system of minor rules that could be followed without any regard To God, with any regard to his original intention, it became a show, a play, hypocrisy, putting on the mask that sat on the table, in a jar on the table by the door. You know what I'm talking about, Beatles fans. Putting on the mask, acting like the part, but not caring about God on the inside. Anyone notice anything in your Bible between verse 15 and 17? What's there? Who has a 16 in their Bible? Who does not have a 16 in their Bible? Where'd it go? What does verse 16 say? Somebody read it. If anyone has ears, let him hear. Why is that not in some of our Bibles, but it's in some of our other Bibles? It's because of the translation. I'm just going to take a two-second side trip so you can understand why some people say, oh, the new translations have cut out the Bible. They've removed important things, and you don't really have the whole Bible. You just have parts of it. 
Well, this particular verse was not in the oldest manuscripts of Scripture. So in 1611, when the King James authorized version was written, they worked with all the manuscripts that they had, and this verse was there. And then in the 20th century, new manuscripts turned up, and they found out that they were even older than the ones used by the 1611 translations, and they did not have this verse in it. So that's why it's left out of the recent translations. Did we lose anything by taking that verse out? Is there any doctrine that's missing? Have we lost God's intention or Jesus' words? In verse 14, it says, Hear me, all of you, and understand. So some of the scholars think that that was added by a copyist. Him who has ears, let him hear. Jesus said that a lot of times. It appears in other places, but it's a repeat of something that's already been said. So that's just a little aside to help you understand translations and why when you look at it, you could say, what happened to 16? Now you know. Jesus was speaking on God's behalf. He's making an authoritative declaration. It's what is inside you that matters. The things outside you can't make you unclean, but it's things that come out of you. The religious leaders had twisted all of this to their own advantage, making themselves look better by saying, all of the things around you, all of these traditions, all the things that you do in public, that's what makes you clean, righteous, and holy. That's what makes God accept you. It doesn't matter what's going on in your heart as long as you follow the rules and look good while you're doing it. And that's true of a lot of religious systems today. Well, of course, this left the disciples totally confused. How could their religious leaders be so wrong and have been, been wrong for thousands of years? The Mishnah, the Talmud, had been written over a series of centuries, and they kept adding to it and explaining more things and adding and adding and adding. So now Jesus explains it in the last part of this chapter, verses 17 down to 23. He entered the house. He left the people, the crowd. He now has his disciples around him, and they say, explain this parable to us. What parable? I didn't hear a parable. It's really more of a riddle than a parable. Jesus said, there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. So what's going in, what's going out? Jesus explains this. It's not things outside of you that defile or contaminate you with sin. Your sin is deep inside you. It's in your heart. And that sin comes out of you in your thoughts, in your words, in your actions. It's not the actions outside that cause you to sin. It's what's going on in your heart. And he gets very specific. He talks about stuff you do in the bathroom. These are things you're not allowed to talk at the table in my family. You can't bring up bathroom-related things unless it's, can I be excused to go to the bathroom? Jesus said, what enters you goes into your stomach and it is expelled. That's the bathroom part. What goes into you comes out of you, right? That's a our part of our system. Food in, waste out. That's how we live and breathe and get energy and strength. And Jesus said, all of that stuff on the outside just passes through you. So is that what causes you to sin? And remember, for thousands of years, it has been about which food you're allowed to eat. How can you prepare it? If you mix it with this, if you cook it in this pot without cleaning it three times, if you... all of these rules about what comes into you, and they said that's what makes you a sinner. And Jesus said, the sin is in your heart. It's still there. That's what defiles you. That's what separates you from God. That's what brings death, physical, spiritual separation from God. And in verse 19, thus he declared all foods clean. All foods. 
wait, didn't God say don't eat these foods and don't eat those creepy crawly things? And there were a lot of good reasons that God gave them their food regulations. We think it probably kept them healthy. And some of these washing things probably also helped them. But Jesus said, everything God made is now clean. He didn't say ignore the Old Testament. He doesn't say those laws are bad. He said, all foods are now clean. And that continued to be a debate through the early church. All of these Jewish people who became believers, who became followers of Christ, brought their traditions with them and they said, okay, new Christians, okay, Gentiles, here's how you be a Christian. Don't eat this, don't eat that, don't do that. Make sure you follow this tradition. Make sure we follow this feast and this festival. And the disciples were confused about this. They had several big meetings and it took a vision from God for Peter to finally get the idea that here's a whole banquet spread before you of a sheet filled with good food. And God said, here's a knife, go eat it. And Peter said, no, Lord, I would never eat that food. And God said, I just gave it to you. It's good. Go eat it. He was helping Peter understand that not only was the food acceptable, but the Gentiles are acceptable. Welcome them into the church. Draw them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. There was a time that I said, stay far away from them because of their idols and their gods. They're going to pull you away. But now I'm saying, share the good news with them. Welcome them into the church. And in verse 21, Jesus gives a list of sins that come out of our hearts. The first six are all evil actions that we do with our bodies. Immorality, evil thoughts, theft, murder, adultery. And then he shifts gears to attitudes of our hearts. Coveting, wickedness, deceit sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. These are things that come out of your heart. They have nothing to do with outward actions. Jesus is the Son of God, and He has the authority to make statements like this. He is the Messiah. He's speaking on God's behalf. He's proclaiming what God's kingdom is like with a new standard of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Jesus' authority was equal with God's. Jesus' authority was over even the Sabbath, over the food laws, over the washing regulations, the ceremonies. Jesus was above all of those things. And the law was fulfilled in Jesus. The whole sacrificial system was set up to show us that blood is what covers sin. A life must be taken to redeem another life. And God sent his own son to be the ultimate sacrifice. So they had been doing this for thousands of years, all to show a picture of what Christ was going to do on the cross. At the final Passover meal, Jesus said, My blood is the new covenant. My blood has replaced the sacrifice of lambs. My body is the bread broken for you. Just like God provided manna, I'm providing spiritual life for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Here's your new tradition. Remember me as you gather together as a church in unity. Break the bread. Drink from the cup. Remember my sacrifice for you. And Jesus replaced not only these rules, but the priests and the ceremonies, you replace them all as being our perfect high priest and saying, you now have direct access to God. Come through me. Again, in Jeremiah, we saw how this change from the written law of Moses brought a freedom in obeying God as we're led by his Holy Spirit this is another passage, 31:33. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people.
people. My law is going to be written on your hearts. The Holy Spirit is going to help you obey them. You don't need a priest. You don't need someone to explain to you, how do I do this? God's given us his word, and I'm so thankful that we can read it today in our own language. People gave their lives so that we could read the Bible in the English language, John Wycliffe and others. The Bible was left in Latin. It was left in Greek and Hebrew so that only scholars could read it because they wanted the control of saying, this is what it means. Go do this, 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 and this. And they continued those human traditions. They kept adding things on and saying, I'm speaking on behalf of God. Just listen to me. What does God say? You're going to worship me in spirit and in truth. And I'm going to give you my law. It's going to be on your hearts. Our internal sin nature, the sin that separates us from God, that's the source of our sin. It doesn't come from hanging around with the wrong people. It doesn't come from being born in the wrong neighborhood. Sin is our selfish, prideful hearts. It poisons our thoughts. It poisons our desires. And it's just waiting to get out in our words and in our actions. That's where people can clearly see it. But it was always there. And it's still there. Sometimes older people, and I'm one of them now, Older people like to say how bad things are today compared to when we were younger. Have you heard that recently? If we look at the news, it seems like we can just say that often. Sin certainly is more visible. It's more acceptable by media, by our society. But sin has always been with us. It's always been in people's hearts. Yes, people had the tradition of going to church every Sunday, and they had the tradition of reading their Bibles. But were they just traditions, or were they really their hearts? The Bible says that the road is wide that leads to hell and destruction, but the road to heaven The road to God is narrow, and only some will find it. So can we look back 100 years ago and say how perfect everything was, and everybody must have been a Christian then? That's not true. People were killing each other on the streets. We think of how cool the Old West was, but if you didn't like somebody, you just pulled your gun out and shot them. That was okay. And a couple hundred years before that, you pulled out your sword and you fought them. There was all kinds of pride and arrogance and people getting their own way using power and might. The sin problems that we have today were there 200 years ago. They were there 2,000 years ago. They just take different forms, but they're still about selfishness. They're still about pride. They're still about envy. They're still about me wanting what I want and getting it no matter what it takes. People choose to follow religious systems that say pleasing God is about following the rules. And that's true of most religion in the world. Here, we'll just tell you what to do, follow those rules, and then everything's going to be good. God's going to weigh the good and the bad, and you'll get in no problem. But that produces hypocrisy. It produces the same legalism. And the bottom line is, we still can't clean ourselves from the outside. We can't just polish the exterior, make sure we look good and we say and do the right things, and then God is okay with our filthy hearts. And then there's people who say, I want nothing to do with religion. You're a bunch of hypocrites. True. There's a lot of people doing that. A lot of people saying they're following a religion, but there's no love in their hearts. There's no care for God. There's no desire to glorify Him. So, They look at their lives and say, I'm free from all of that. But you know what? I still don't feel like I measure up. I'm not thin enough. I don't have enough hair. I'm not enough smart enough. I don't have enough money in my bank account. I'm not driving the best car. I don't have the nicest house in the neighborhood. People don't love me for who I am. 
they love me for this outside stuff. And if I keep doing it, maybe they'll keep liking me, but do they really love me? Even without religion, people realize that they're lost and that there's something inside that's just not right. Even without believing God's word, people know that they are doing the wrong thing. And scripture tells us that God's law, in that sense, is written on the hearts of every man, every woman in our conscience. Jesus explains it's our sin that makes us unclean and unrighteous before a holy God, whether we choose to believe in him or recognize him or not. doesn't matter what faith, what religion you're following. You still have a sin problem, and that starts with your heart. Here's the good news. You can be clean. You can be made whiter than snow on the inside. And that's only through Jesus' blood and his forgiveness. That's what makes us whiter than snow. Confessing my sin, trusting Jesus' death on the cross, and recognizing that he alone can forgive me. He alone can save me. Nothing I do changes my value in God's eyes. Salvation from sin is the gift of life. And that's where we try and find true freedom. And that's where we find unspeakable joy. I'm going to skip this slide. It's going to be on the website and it's going to be at Growth Group tonight. But it's just a summary of God's truth versus man's traditions. And you can go back and find that on the website later. Romans and Galatians tell us that our Christian liberty, the freedom we have in following Christ when we don't have to follow a bunch of rules and laws, is there. God gives us his word, but he tells us, honor me, glorify me in everything you do. You get to figure out what that looks like. But when you have that freedom, don't ever use it to break down others. Don't ever use it to cause a weaker brother or sister to stumble. Use it to build up others. Use it to reach people for Christ. That's what our religion, that's what our freedom is from. So you hear me talking about religion and saying that's what religion is. Religion is a man-made system of beliefs. How do we connect with God? How do we know who God is? How do we please God? That's religion. And Jesus said, I've brought you a relationship. A relationship with God, your creator. You can know him through me, his son. We saw his life lived out. He died on the cross for you and for me so that we could have a relationship, not so that we would have a bunch of rules to follow and say, am I doing this just right? When you have a relationship with someone and you love that person, you want to spend time with them. You want to know what they know. You want to know who they are. How do we know God? We know, it, know him through our word. How do we honor and glorify him? We sing praises to him, and when we come together, we encourage other people in their walk with him as they get to know him. But all of that is done out of hearts that have a desire to know and please God. It's not a checklist saying, if I've done all these things just right, then possibly God might be happy with me today. God says, I don't want you to live your life like that, constantly wondering if you're good enough. I love you enough to send my son. What's in your heart is not good enough, but I'm going to make that clean. Christ's righteousness is a robe that covers over us and makes us whiter than snow. So our takeaways this morning, don't focus on your outward actions to make you right with God. Maybe you grew up in a church where that focus was all about following the rules, about doing everything just right so that God would accept you. And if you continued following the rules, maybe, just maybe, he'd let you in. That's the way man-made religion works. It's all about rules. Even God's people took what God gave them as laws 
for living your life. And they added a bunch of their own traditions, ignoring what God intended. You need to repent. You need to find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Becoming a follower of Jesus is not a religion. It's a relationship with God, the Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ. For those of you who have already trusted him as Savior, allow the Holy Spirit to keep working on you. That's why we pray before we read Scripture every morning. God, prepare my heart to hear your word. Let it be good soil so that your word can grow and I can change and become more like your son, Jesus Christ. That should be our prayer every time we come to his word. Holy Spirit, keep working on me. Apostle Paul said, I'm sure of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We're never going to be perfect here on earth because we still have this physical body. We still have a sin nature that constantly is at war within us, battling with us. But on that day, when we see Jesus, when we stand before him, in an instant, we're going to be changed and made like him. That robe of righteousness that we've been wearing becomes us. We're in Christ. We have his righteousness for all of eternity. If you've been forgiven by Jesus, if you've been saved, then don't become a religious person who puts rules ahead of loving people and bringing them to meet Jesus. Sometimes even in churches that are desiring to love Christ, to worship him, to love people, we still come up with, well, this room is special. It's just for that. And you can't do this here and you can't do that there. And they start to sound like, oh, that must be how I'm accepted in this church. That must be how I'm accepted by God if I just follow the rules. We don't want to do that here. We want people to see that they can become truly clean by confessing our sins to God because he is faithful and just. And he promises to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mark's going to come and we're going to close in a song Please bow with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for these examples from the life of Christ where we can see him explaining what it means to follow and obey you, what it means to glorify your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you that your blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness and it cleans us from the inside out. I don't need to try and clean myself up by acting and saying and doing the right things. Lord, all of those things come out of a love for you. But you don't look at me and say, you have to do all of these things or I won't love you anymore. Thank you for your unconditional love. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints, in the holy and righteous name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.